It's become a national symbol of Britishness, from warplanes to mods. But did you ever wonder why the fledgling British air power adopted this particular design? Well, it all has a connection to these blokes, who created the Insignia 114 years before powered flight. So, unfortunately, this most British of motifs, without a doubt, has a touch that Gallic je ne sais quoi. When the Great War began, Britain's air power, the Royal Flying Corps, was a small and arguably insignificant organisation. Boasting just four squadrons, which operated an assortment of Blériot, Henri Farman, B-2As and Sopwith tabloids, the RFC crossed into France on the 12th of August 1914. Initially, the British aircraft carried no national markings at all, which soon proved to be quite dicey. The performance of these early machines left much to be desired. Much of the RFC's reconnaissance flights were conducted at only a few thousand feet above the troops below. Whenever any aircraft went over, the infantry was likely to open fire on it, especially Lamy de Terre. In fact, flying low over woodland was a trick that many reconnaissance pilots used later in the war to flush out concealed troops and remove the element of surprise before anticipated enemy attacks. For the ground troops themselves, the attitude of shoot first, then perhaps think about asking questions later, was fully justified. In addition to fairly benign reconnaissance duties, aircraft were then starting to carry out other roles, including the targeting of enemy troops. The use of flechettes was a particularly nasty, if somewhat inaccurate approach. For the RFC, the need for a change manifested itself on the 18th of August 1914, when they arrived behind the front lines at Maubeuge, near the French-Belgian border. This was where the British aircraft first came under the rather maladroit marksmanship of the French poilu. With the BEF arriving on its way towards Mons, there were now both ally and compatriot to target British aircrews. In order to minimise the danger to its own aircrew, a long night was spent hastily painting large Union Jacks under each wing of the British aircraft. However, this had results not fully anticipated. Aircraft were extremely rare. Many of the troops would have been seeing them for the first time, and so telling a Blériot from a Talba would have been almost impossible for the average Tommy or Poilu. With the idea that all aircraft were to be treated as hostile, already well established, adding big red crosses under the British machines didn't help. German aircraft also had crosses painted on them. In the excitement of seeing one of these rare flying machines, one cross may very well have looked like another when viewed from below. On the 26th of October 1914, a true tragedy struck. Flying in a BE-2, pilot, Lieutenant Cyril Hoskin, and observer Captain Theodore Crean were shot down in flames while spotting for an artillery shoot. They had descended to as low as a thousand feet to make sure of their target. This brought them within range of the excellent marksmanship of the BEF below. The French were just as guilty of such incidents of friendly fire. On another occasion, after the loss of this BE-2, an Irish observer from 3 Squadron, Dermot Allen, accosted a French commander. In his pronounced stutter, he asked the Frenchman quite coolly, Do you mind telling your men not to fire on us? It puts us off. In answer to this understatement of the seriousness of the situation, the French commander explained the similarity between the British and German crosses and made a simple suggestion. Why didn't the British just adopt the French round national markings? The cocade tricolore had been painted on French machines since 1912 and had its roots in La Révolution. On the 12th of July 1789, two days before the famous storming of the Bastille, it was a revolutionary journalist called Camille de Moulin who, while inciting a Parisian crowd to revolt, stopped to ask a more important question. What branding should they use? Before anything else happened, this growing revolution needed a logo. Initially, everyone seemed happy with green being the colour worn to bring down the Ancien Regime, until someone pointed out the next day that this was the personal colour of the king's brother, the Count of Artois. Next, it was decided by those who wanted to revolt, but not too excessively, that a citizen militia sporting a two-coloured cockade was just the ticket. The ancient colours of Paris, blue and red, seemed to do nicely. By the 17th of July, King Louis XVI was sporting the definitive design on his own hat. 
While meeting with the new French National Guard formed in Paris, its members were wearing the now famous blue and red cockade of the militia, to which their commander, the Marquis de Lafayette, had added a white band, representing loyalty to the sovereign. They made the reluctant king wear the same motif on his hat as he appointed a new revolutionary to be mayor of Paris and approved the formation of the National Guard, led by Lafayette. The new tricolore would become the official logo of the revolution and its colours would later be used in the French national flag. And now, 121 short years later, there was a different Frenchman suggesting the British paint their war machines with their republican symbol. <laughs> Not on your Nelly, monsieur. Purely down to British pride, the colours of the French cockade were reversed. Now the Germans were clearly the only crosses in the sky and the Allies were distinctly the noughts. From the ground, it was now easier to see the difference between the two shapes on the bottom of low-flying aircraft, and this is no doubt why American aircraft adopted a similar roundel when they arrived on the front in 1918. From the air, and among anti-aircraft gun crews, aircraft recognition developed more as a skill, and aircraft were often identified more on their shape and, from the ground only, the sound of their engines. Still, for the troops and a confused airman, national markings undoubtedly helped too. However, this was by no means the end of the story for the RAF Roundel. During the Great War, the Royal Flying Corps and later Royal Air Force didn't change the design of the Roundel much, except for making the colours a bit brighter post-1916 and adding a white ring to it when painting on camouflage. By the Second World War, a lot had changed. It had been realised as early as 1918 that when using a camouflage paint scheme on an aircraft, the white ring of the early cockade design stuck out like a sore thumb. On night flying aircraft at the end of the First World War, the white was removed and replaced with a thicker dark red section. With the low density of nocturnal flights, it was better to avoid detection from the ground and air at all costs. This design was used on all aircraft, especially in the ETO and MTO, from 1937 on the upper wings, right through to the end of the Second World War. PRU aircraft also carried the same design roundel on all surfaces throughout the war. There was also a short period between 1937 and March 1939 when the other roundels on the camouflage surfaces were painted with a thick outer yellow ring. This was to aid with recognition in the air, but it was adapted before hostilities broke out. The thickness of the yellow ring was greatly reduced, and a similar motif was added to the fuselage of all aircraft regardless of the camouflage until 1942. From 1942, the design changed again, with much thicker blue and red rings being used. 1942 was also the year where the RAF was called upon to fight the Empire of Japan, and a similar issue emerged as that of 1914. As all Japanese aircraft sported what the Americans aptly christened meatballs on their wings and fuselage, the RAF's own red dot had to go. To avoid confusion, a two-colour design cockade was adopted, blue and white with an outer yellow ring to aid in recognition. The Royal Australian Air Force adopted a very similar roundel for their own aircraft. This was soon replaced in the RAF with a simple two-tone blue roundel to further aid in distinguishing Allied and Japanese aircraft. Since 1947, the standard RF roundel has returned almost to its 1916 roots, with a few variations for low visibility and stealth rolls in grey, almost defeating the purpose of using identification markings. If you found this video interesting, please give it a like to help it spread to more people. And if you want to support the channel, the best way to do that is to leave a comment telling me what you think about the video and watch the next video on screen for you right now. It's a good one.